All right, so thank you so much, uh, Barbara Oakley, for joining me here today. I know that uh, many of my readers probably already know about you. They may have even found my blog through your very, very popular, I believe it's the most popular uh, massively open online course of all time, Learning How to Learn, uh, that you did with Terry Sajnowski. And I think you've also given a lot of insight into the learning process and how you can think about that better. So you, in particular, you've written uh, two books now. One was uh, A Mind for Numbers, which was about how you can sort of succeed in, in learning. And then the second book you just recently talked about and just released is Mind Shift, which is about changing your attitudes towards learning. So welcome, and I'm hoping to have an interesting interview with you today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Scott. It's always, uh, it's always fun for me to follow your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to start with uh, a small issue, but I think is quite an interesting one, and the research on should you listen to music while you're studying? That's an interesting question, and it's kind of funny because when I when I speak in public, that's always one of the biggest questions people have, and I, I think it's because we often hear that oh you shouldn't you should oh, you shouldn't listen to music you should always just be focusing exactly on what you're supposed to be learning and so forth. But the interesting thing is that if you go and look at the research on whether or not you should listen to music, basically you can find research that supports pretty much any position you might want to have supported. So if you don't like music, you'll find research that says, no, no, don't listen to music. And you'll find other research that says, oh, it's quite all right. About the only things that um, research is saying pretty much for sure is that you shouldn't listen to super loud music when you're trying to study. And if the music has lyrics and you're trying to do anything verbal, which mostly you're trying to read something or, or understand something, you may not want to listen to music with lyrics just because it's interfering. Both are going on in the same parts of the brain. But in general, some people uh, find that music, particularly music they like, uh, kind of can enhance what they're doing. So I think, I'll just speak from personal experience, not from the research, of course, which you've delved into a lot more than I have on this particular point. But I found that there's certain activities that you could say are learning related that I do really well with music and some that I cannot do at all with music. And so I think that might go partially with what you're talking about, about how it relates to verbal or your ability to kind of process words and, and thinking about uh, language. Because for me, for instance, when I am uh, doing a writing task, if I'm writing, uh, I cannot listen to any music at all. If I have music, it just immediately, I get distracted. I can't focus on it. I can't get the sort of internal voice in my head gets kind of drowned out. Whereas if I'm doing, let's say, uh, a programming task, which on the surface, it looks quite similar. I find that I have no problem doing it for that, which I think is kind of interesting. Did your research turn up anything that kind of supports that conclusion about that maybe, you know, for certain types of tasks, it might be better for listening to music and certain types of tasks it might be better to stay away from it? Yes. That, in fact, that that is goes right along with what research findings are showing. It If you really have to focus intently on a difficult task where you don't want to make mistakes, for example, you're doing your tax returns or something like that, you would not want to listen to music. It, it, it might it might kind of disturb what you're doing. For uh, I haven't found anything in particular that says writing and listening to music might be uh, you know, counter to one another. But for me personally, I find the same thing. I, I can't write and listen to music at the same time. But if I'm, uh, let's say I am grading uh, tests, well, for me, listening to music while grading tests kind of helps me get through the pain of, oh no, how could you make this mistake? You know, and, and it kind of helps me get through it. It's not really a, a detailed, intense task. So I think it depends a lot on the task. And, and this brings me to a, a sort of a related topic. And that is, 
let's say that you're sitting there and you're really trying to memorize a list, for example. So it's a, a, an intense, focused task and you're trying to do it quickly. So, for example, you're in a memory competition. You would... Um, you probably don't want to listen to music. And in fact, a lot of memory competitors will put on earphones and try to do everything they can to block out their sound. But let's say that you're um, a med school student and you're trying to learn how the heart works, right? You might want to do that in a coffee shop. You're studying for that because what happens is you'll be studying away uh, and then somebody will click a cup or there'll be this kind of clink or a little conversation. And what that little disruption does is momentarily it draws you into default mode activity, which is a, a very different neural network that's much more kind of broader uh, within the brain. It's a, a neural resting state. And that momentary respite kind of gives you a bigger picture perspective on whatever you're learning. And learning something like how the heart functions is not just a simple memorized list. It involves a, a lot of this is going in, at the same time this is coming out, and you kind of have to understand them in just all together. And sometimes that stepping back, which a little bit of noise can make you do, can help you alternate between the tight focus and the bigger picture that you need to understand these more complex kinds of systems. That's very interesting. And I know in your recent book, Mind Shift, I remember reading a, a section where you were talking about the role of focus and distractions. And obviously, uh, focus is something that a lot of students struggle with. And it is something that probably has an important role to play in learning. But you actually bring up a kind of more nuanced view that you should have showed that there's maybe a role for uh, somewhat less focus. I, I'm, I'm quoting kind of one of the subtitles you have in one of your books where you said, focus is good, but not all learning requires focus. So maybe you could expand a little bit on that. What do you think the role of focus and concentration is in learning? So focus, when we... It's a learning is a little bit like uh, roasting. Uh, if you're roasting a, a slab of beef, for example, in an oven, you cook it for a while, and then when you take it out, it sits for a while, and it's just sitting. It's not in the oven. No cooking, but you need to do that. Otherwise, the roast just won't quite taste right uh, when you're done. It's a little bit like that for learning. You're focusing, that's like cooking in the oven, and then you take a little break. And that break, what's happening at that time is you're, you're going into more of a resting state. You're not directing your thinking so much. You're letting it kind of naturally go where it wants to go. And that's the time when your brain does a consolidation. So you can almost think of it as when you're focusing, you're, you're um, let's see, you're grabbing books, right? So you're just picking them out and ordering them off of Amazon, let's say. And then when you're in resting state, you're, it, the books have arrived and now you're putting a little label on them and then putting them in your, your own library shelf with a label so you know how to grab them afterwards. That's what happens when you're in this sort of default mode resting state. Uh, it, it's a state when you can consolidate some of these activities. So this is sort of an interesting idea that not studying or not actually spending time learning might have a beneficial effect in problem solving or learning or kind of building those kind of skills. And I know this is something you talked about in the Mind for Numbers and in your Learning How to Learn course, but what do you think the practical implication of this is? Like, I mean, I've got a big calculus test coming up or I'm trying to learn a new programming language and I have limited time in the day. What would you say is the this idea, this concept from the research, what does that imply about how I should be organizing my studying to do that most effectively? Well, it certainly doesn't imply that uh, that you can just magically put it in your brain by not studying it, right? You, you first have to start by focusing. But I think the best practical takeaway we can get from this is that you you focus and and then when you reach a point where you're kind of either tiring of it 
or you're a little frustrated, it's just not going into your brain, that means switch your focus. So if you can switch it to um, kind of as different a topic as you as you can, let's say you're studying language for a, a final and you're focus, 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 then switch your uh, focus to something that's more like math, if you can. Um, if you can't do that and you're really tired, then switch your focus to taking a walk or something like that. It's always, there's a, a lot of evidence that good consolidation takes place when you're getting some kind of physical motion or physical exercise. So I think the practical takeaway is when you feel yourself tiring, switch your attention for a little while uh, to something else and, and try to sort of not multitask by doing things at the same time, but kind of switch your attention to different things. And that'll allow you to work in a more fresh manner on each topic. Well, that brings me to another point. Um, a lot of students I've, I've met and talked to, when, especially when they're in exam time and they're really trying to prepare right before an exam, or if you just generally have a lot of learning to do, one of the first things that gets cut is often exercise. So you decide, you know what, I, I got to study right now, I'll go to the gym or I'll do that, you know, next month or, you know, next semester or start working on that. What do you feel about that idea as it relates to studying? I mean, realistically, there are going to be some times in your life where it's it's really crazy and you've got three days of testing or something like that and that's what you've got to focus on. But if it gets much longer than that, um, let's say you've got two weeks of intense ex, you know, testing that you've got to be working on, every moment that you, you can, like try to walk between classes or, you know, really try to capture some physical activity because you will find, and, and I certainly find this myself, that, that that physical, whatever little physical break you can get, you will grow. Uh, you'll just be fresher at whatever you're trying to work on. Um, just jumping to a different topic now, this is something related to career development. I know a lot of people are interested in the concepts of learning as it applies to, you know, not specifically academics, but one's career. And I know that one of the sort of popular models or ways of thinking about uh, your career is the T model, which is where you have a deep specialty in one area and then you have sort of a broader, shallower knowledge over a larger area. Now, you actually advocate a slightly different approach, which you call the Pi model, where instead of just a single deep focus, perhaps you have two. Now, they might not be exactly equal, but you have sort of two specialties. Now, why do you think that learning two things uh, well, as opposed to just trying to learn one thing well, might be a beneficial career strategy to adopt? For one thing, we know that there's lots of changes coming up in careers. I mean, artificial intelligence is making big inroads, even in highly specialized careers like uh, like the law, medicine, engineering, and so forth. So it provides some sense of career resiliency. If you've got something to fall back on, uh, it, it can help make your career a little safer. More than that, when you learn something else a little bit in depth, it almost invariably adds to whatever your first field is. You'll bring insights, often through metaphor, um, to whatever that original field is, and it can be extremely helpful. For me, for example, my first career was as a Russian translator. So you might think, well, what does that have to do with your second career becoming an electrical engineer? Well, uh, it, it turns out that learning a language gives you some meta skills about how to learn in general, even in math and science. And it was particularly helpful for me to have learned a language because it made learning math and science a uh, not easy, but easier because I knew some of the techniques that could help. It also, learning a second sort of skill can help you to be more, uh, more 
it's like you're learning, you're keeping learning incorporated in your lifestyle, and that keeps you mentally flexible. And it also shows your your employer that you're not just a one-trick pony, that you're really open to learning new things. And that is unquestionably beneficial for your job. Definitely. So I think I'd like to just end the interview by asking you, you know, you've looked a lot of the research, you've, through your course, uh, learning how to learn, you've worked with, uh, I think now it's millions of students who have taken the course and participated in it. And so this has given you, I think, a unique vantage point of both combining the research and sort of what is typical practice or what people are out there using in terms of learning techniques. What do you think right now would be your opinion of the most useful piece of advice or most useful concept when it comes to learning that is the least frequently applied or that is, you know, the least in the common usage in uh, learning environments? Oh, it's unquestionably the idea of chunking. And chunking is a way of gaining procedural fluency uh, in whatever topic you're trying to become an expert is in. And so you may say, well, what's procedural fluency? And, And what it really is, is First, let's take something simple, like backing up a car. So when you first back up a car, I mean, it's crazy. It is so hard. You, you, do you look in the front mirror? Do you look in the side mirror? Do you look behind you? Uh, you, you really, it, it's very difficult, and you go the wrong way, and, and you're thinking, I'll never be able to learn to back up a car, right? And within a, a few days or a week or two, you begin to learn to back up the car. And in fact, after a little bit, you all you have to do is think, oh, I'm going to back up the car. And then you start doing it and you're talking to your friends, you're listening to the radio. It's super easy. And what you, what that is, is you've acquired that backing up of a car, which is a, a very complex procedure, has become one sort of one united neural chunk in your mind and all you have to do is call that into your working memory and because it's one united thing it doesn't like block the other parts of your working memory and you can actually do other things at that time and this kind of chunking is the same thing that you need when you're learning how to dance how to play a musical instrument you learn one chord one chunk you learn several chords together you ching you know kind of uh chain those those chunks together into one longer chunk it's when you're learning a language it's when you're learning in math and science so so we make the big mistake in math and science or or programming or something where we will take a problem and we'll do a homework problem, turn it in, and never look at it again. Well, you don't want to do that for key homework problems. You would never sing a song one time and say, oh, I know that song. You want to take that homework problem, if it's really important, or a key example problem in your textbook, see if you can work it cold. And if you need to look a little bit at something, you know, to get a a sort of a hint, do that. But then try again, see if you can work it cold and practice that for several days. And then pretty soon you'll find you can look at that, that problem. And it, it's almost like backing up the car. You can go, oh, oh, you do this, this, this. You don't even really need to think about it. And when you know the problems that well, you, you look at exam problems and suddenly you can knit together two very different ideas that the, the instructor might be having you do. And it, it seems very easy. So this idea of chunking, I think, is the most important uh, and uh, most neglected idea in learning. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barb, for joining us. I think that this has been just a really enlightening uh, interview, and I know that many of the people who are listening are going to want to learn more. And so I'm going to recommend that you take both of Barbara Oakley's uh, massively open online courses, uh, Learning How to Learn and MindShift. I'll include some links with uh, this video. And those are completely free if you want to just join them without certification certificate so you can attend the course and learn all about her ideas when it comes to learning and all this research-based advice you can do to improve your studying tactics. And then also uh, I highly recommend getting her two books, uh, A Mind for Numbers and her newly released book, Mind Shift. Uh, Is there anything else you'd like to add, Barb? 
Oh, just that I, I, I learned so much from reading your materials that I, I also recommend just keep right on going with watching Scott's videos <laughs> and reading his blog posts. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.